I think authenticity is, to me, is the key. That's the element on stage that makes, that takes you from a good performance to a great performance. It's that you're seeing that artist taking their own talents, their own expertise to the edge. That's Matthew Schilvach, General Director of the San Francisco Opera, discussing digital transformation during this period of very rapid change. Matthew, tell us about the San Francisco Opera. Well, we're one of the great and historic opera companies of the world. We're about to turn 100 in about a year's time. And we're a company that brings together all of the art forms, music, poetry, visual arts, uh, symphony, everything comes together in these one uh, singular moments of emotional expression on the stage, these life-affirming experiences. People remember their opera going from 60 years ago as though it were yesterday. That kind of emotional intensity is what we uh, deliver deliver on the stage. Um, we're a company that employs around a thousand people a year in various capacities. We have relationships with eight different unions. Uh, we do around eight productions of different operas a year, as well as media work, education work, diversity work. Um, it's uh, a lot of different elements coming together and particularly exciting at the moment. And maybe we can talk about this later, but uh, we're about to bring on our new music director, Ansan Kim. She is the first uh, female music director of a major opera company, and she'll be joining us as a fourth only ever music director coming on in just a few weeks. Matthew, during this past year, you're, you have an opera company and you have a performance space, an auditorium. How did you manage when we couldn't go out? It was as though a switch had flipped for the arts. Um, it was March 16th of last year when San Francisco went into shutdown. And um, admittedly, we were not in performance at the time. We were about to begin uh, chorus rehearsals. Uh, our colleague company, The Ballet, was, however. And it was just as though someone flipped the switch and immediately these venues shut down. We were some of the first venues to shut down. Uh, we are high aerosol generating venues and large gathering places. And so we were the first to shut down. And we've been some of the, will be some of the last to come back. Um, so it really was a this kind of punch to the gut, I, I think, in terms of how do we continue as organizations to do what we do, which is to connect to people. We're a very collective enterprise, whether that collectivity is on stage in terms of the hundreds of people who do what we do or the thousands of people who are watching what we do. And so it's really been quite uh, an experience to try and figure out how we move that forward and not just stay dark for this whole time. Um, but it's amazing. San Francisco in particular has been very, very uh, conservative, very, very health conscious during this time period. It's only literally in the last few weeks where we could even have a singer and a pianist in the same room together. So the, the, the threshold for trying to figure out how to move through this in San Francisco, I think, has been particularly acute. I have to assume that this dramatically changed the way you think about performance, the way you think about relating to the audience, the way you think about managing the organization. Absolutely. I mean, I think both on the internal and the external basis. And I think in terms of the audience relationship, we had to think about how do you sustain the passion, I mean, our audience is driven by so much passion for what we put on stage and they, they come back decade after decade uh, with these amazing relationships. We, we define the cultural landscape so much for our core audience and we wanna bring in new audiences too. And so how do you do that when you cannot gather anymore? And so as we went through the year, it was really a learning process um, beginning with um, delivering archival content and we have a lot of good archival content we can deliver and then sort of moving into how do you create content and it's amazing how quickly that journey happened from the kind of layering of, of content with people doing things on zoom um, to some of the more innovative work we've done with company like elk uh, which has allowed us to be much more symbiotic and we, we can maybe dig into that a little bit and then sort of moving back into the live and getting to a place where we can actually deliver a live experience to people so it's we had to bring in all of the creativity, all of the ingenuity of the company and, and find a new way to tell the stories that we want to tell. That's very interesting. So how did you find new ways, or, or let me ask it this way, what kinds of new ways to tell the story did you uncover and develop? 
There was a very interesting chapter that we began of, of innovation for the company, I'd say around the summer of last year. And we were struggling with uh, the traditional video sharing platforms um, because the, the, the usual video sharing platforms have two challenges for what we do. First of all, there's a latency involved and it's imperceptible if we're just having a conversation, but it's very perceptible if you're trying to make music together. Um, and then the second thing is that a lot of video platforms only allow one person to be speaking at a time. So you, you kind of trades off between the, between the people engaged. And so we had tried working with Zoom and other platforms for things like our chorus rehearsals. And, and in, the, in the moment, that was very valuable because our chorus director could keep teaching the choristers, um, but it was very much a one-way situation. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how do we get to be symbiotic? How do we get to have an engagement of real music making where two people or more are uh, uh, kind of riffing off each other. And it's amazing, actually, this has happened so much through history where opera has been one of the great testing grounds for technology. I think it's true of radio, it's true of television going back into the early part of the 20th century. And I think opera pushes everything to the extremes. I mean, you, you think about the, the power at which an opera singer is singing, and we've all heard, you know, singing crackle on radios where, where an opera singer, you know, gets distorted because the speaker can't handle the, uh, the, the sort of extremes of range of, a, of an opera singer. So opera has often been used as this way of, of um, testing new technologies. And, that, and that's what we were doing here with Elk. We were like really putting this through the paces to say, how does it work when you get uh, incredibly trained musicians and singers trying to make music together? When you talk about the symbiotic nature of music making, can you elaborate on that? This is one of the real things that the, the pandemic highlighted in a way, which is just how important the collective aspect of what we do is. Um, in those early days of the pandemic, we and other companies were layering things down. So the pianist would record a track first, they'd send it off to the singer in their home, they would play it through earphones and then sing to that. <clears throat> you can do that and it's, you know, it's a version of karaoke essentially but there's no responsiveness in it. And music making is inherently responsive and it's inherently unpredictable in that way. And that's the beauty of it. That's the magic of it, where you have a person who is playing the piano, they're hearing a singer do something and they do it slightly differently every time and the pianist reacts and they do something differently. And then of course you bring the audience into that equation and the whole thing becomes even more symbiotic because there's actually this real energy transfer that happens between musicians and audience members. And you feel it in, in, the, in the opera house, you feel it in the symphony hall. If you have a great performance, the audience is reacting and that reaction gives energy back to the performers. They up their game, the audience is up, up to their game and it kind of goes like this. And it's kind of, that's where you have these life-changing moments in the theater. And so that's been one of the real challenges of this whole period until we can get back to the live is that um, you, you miss out on all of that energy transfer happening. It's, it sounds you know a little uh, fuzzy, but it's, it really is true. That's what creates these moments of, of great memory in, in, in the theater. What was the impact on performers during this period of time of great upheaval where they're in separate locations, where you're not being able to give live performances, where it's all over video? What was the impact on the, on the singers and the musicians? It was huge, Michael. I mean, it's both financially, many singers lost their entire year worth of income in a, in a matter of days if not if, if not weeks as companies just canceled um and then of course you try and cling on to the possibility that you can do something but then you have to accept that no you have to cancel this part of the season you have to cancel that part of the season they're just waves of cancellation because so many of of the opera singers themselves are they are independent people they go from company to company across the world and so they're not they're not tied to a particular company I'm very proud in San Francisco, we were one of the very few companies to actually keep payments going, not only to our own company members, but to principal artists as well, because they are part of the family of our companies. They are, they are the people who are singing you know, the, the incredible arias that uh, pull us into the opera house. And so we wanted to make sure we kept them connected, but that was quite a, a unique thing over the course of the last year. So financially, there was a huge, um, the, the bottom just fell out of people's lives. But I think also artistically, I mean, again, the, 
this is how people express themselves. This is how people share themselves with the world. And it's a very public sharing, right? I mean, it's, they're putting their own body, their own vocal cords out there in front of the public every night. It's a very raw and vulnerable thing. And to lose that, to lose that connection and to be able to share with audiences was really tough. Now, many, many artists became um, incredible media producers over the course of this time period. And, they, and there were some amazing outcomes from that in terms of singers who have developed their own production capabilities, singers who have developed their own shows and, um, and chat shows. And hopefully a lot of that will continue because I think it allowed singers to find new ways to engage with the public. But I, I, just to give you an example of, of how um, impactful this was. So in... Um, in April and May, just gone, we came back with an amazing outdoor experience. We did a live drive-in opera up in Marin County. Um, and we converted a parking lot into this amazing outdoor multimedia stage. Uh, it was the stage from the Coachella Music Festival. We had 26 foot high video walls, uh, an orchestra. I mean, we, we were able to do that 20 minutes north of the city, even if we couldn't do it in the city. And one of our lead singers in that told me on the last night, and we did 11 performances, and he said, you know, I, I was never able to fully relax into the experience because I, I always thought that tonight's going to get canceled. I could not believe that every show was actually happening because I'm now so conditioned that everything is going to get canceled. And so it was, it was joyful to see, first of all, that wasn't the case, but then to also just see all of that energy kind of coming back and surging into, into these performances. But I think it really, it really hit performers very hard um, because, again, it's, that's their life force. That's how, they, that's how they make their way through the world. And what were you able to do or what did you try to do in order to make it easier for those performers? during that difficult time for them? We wanted to, as I say, keep payments being made, uh, compensation benefits. That was very important to us philosophically as a company. And we spent a, a lot of time last year renegotiating union contracts and so forth to make that possible. Um, as, as hard as it still was, I, I don't want to belittle the sacrifices that people still made through that, um, but making sure there was some compensation going. But then bringing people in and, and making music wherever we could, including digitally. We had a couple of concerts last year where we brought in artists who would have been with us on the stage and celebrated them. Um, we also, I think through, the, through sharing out our archive, that was very impactful for people just to see their own work, even if it was in prior seasons going out. And then just some of the digital pieces we have been doing um, in the last six months or so, which have really sort of got to a deeper level of storytelling and engagement with, uh, with singers as well. And so it's been trying to keep the creative energy of the company alive. I will say as well, that's happened on a technical level as well, because um, you know we have this amazing group of technicians and craftspeople too. And one of the things we were able to do through pretty much the whole pandemic, with the exception of those first few months, was we kept our scene shop open, we kept our costume shop open, we built an entire new set uh, over the course of last fall, which we'll use uh, now in a few months. Our costume shop stayed open, we were building costumes, we had a great costume sale for the public so they could come and buy costumes. Um, and so, again, just keeping the creative elements of the opera moving forward at all times and just saying, we're still here, we're still being creative wherever we can be, uh, trying to give that hope to both the company and the community that you know, we're not losing that connection to creativity. Obviously, the audience, as you described earlier, is a very big part of this. What does the audience expect from you and how did those expectations evolve over the last year and what did you do in response to meet those expectations in what was essentially an impossible situation? I think in some ways our audiences, there's a certain level of perfection that audiences expect from us and they expect that when that curtain goes up that all of the elements, and I don't think it's a conscious expectation, but you know, as, as the world-class arts company, you are delivering these experiences that need to be absolutely um, on point from every single element, the artistry, the music, the technical elements. Um, and then 
all of that becomes then manifest into these life-changing experiences. So, you know, audiences come into our space and they want to be swept away into these magical times and places. Um, they want to be taken away from this themselves or conversely find themselves in these stories that we're telling on stage. There's a huge amount of kind of reflective um, reflection of yourself that I think we, we find in the opera house. We, we tell these stories on stage like La Traviata, which is all about a, ultimately a woman dying from consumption, but we find resonance in it, not because she's dying from consumption, but because we, we understand our own lost loves, uh, things that never came to be that could have been. We, we find ourselves in these stories. And so I think that's what audiences expect from us is, is that at an incredibly high level. So as, as we kind of worked through the last year and trying to find that, I mean, there was a certain amount of growth for us and, and other arts companies, because now you're suddenly having to try and recreate that in a digital sense. Um, and then when we get into our drive-in uh, Barbara of Seville that I mentioned in Marin, trying to create that now in a live sense. But all of it is very new and you're doing it on the fly. And so the, I think the lessons around how we innovate as companies, how we try new products, being a little more willing to take risks because I think that's one of the that can be one of the barriers in in large arts companies trying to innovate is because we have this perfectionist mindset and you know when that curtain goes up you, it's not a place to be innovating because everything has to happen to the split second with everything else and so that's actually been some of the liberating elements of the last year is that you know, we've never done a drive-in opera before, so there's no expectation of how to do it. We bring all of the skills and the creativity to bear, and it was phenomenal. Um, but we had license to try it differently and to experiment, and the same with the digital as well. And I think audiences were were excited to go with us um, on that journey. Uh, some just crave the live experience, and they want to get back to that. But I think others have been very curious about how we can find those new modes of expression. It's interesting to hear you talk about innovation, because when one thinks of an arts organization, it's all about the creativity. And obviously, there's such a tight link between creativity and innovation. There really is. And, you know, we, we get, as, as, a, as a company, as I say, that has up to a thousand people coming through the doors each year, there's a huge amount of complexity involved. But at the, at the core of it, it is a creative enterprise. It is a creative endeavor. And we're telling these stories that can be hundreds of years old in, in their origin um, in new and fresh ways. And every night is, is, is different and has a different energy to it. So the, the entirety of what we do is that creativity. Um, but it's in a big it's in a big box, right? I mean, we have 3,000 seats in the house uh, at San Francisco Opera. Um, there's not a lot of room for margin for error. But even within that, a singer is doing something completely different every night. They're, they're expressing something in a live way, and live is never the same from one moment to the next way. So I think what we've learned is that those skills for innovation are very much present within us as a company. It's just coming up with the structures that allow us to unlock those in, in new ways and, and to be willing to fail sometimes. I mean, again, that's, that, that word is not in our lexicon usually because that's a, that can be a disaster. Um, but if we give ourselves license to try new things in smaller contexts, in different contexts, we, we've done some great work with the Stanford uh, D School, Stanford Design School, over the last few years. And that was, that's been liberating because it, it just allowed us to remember that there, there can be a process of creation and, and discovery and some things work, some things don't. By the time they get to the main stage, they have to work. Um, but we can develop different channels that give us the license to, to be more playful in how we think about our own creativity. Does the audience give you that license to experiment and take those risks? There's a variety, and I think it comes back to where we experiment. Um, and I think we saw that in Marin with the drive-in. We could be very playful with that production. We 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 took apart Barbara of Seville, you know, this great classic opera by Rossini, and we we reordered it. Um, we kind of got rid of a lot of the dramatic narrative in it and replaced it with a different kind of narrative. It was all about coming back to life in rehearsal rooms and things. Um, we use much more street clothes than we would typically use uh, as part of the storytelling. We used a lot more video than we would typically use. And audiences loved it. It was incredible, just the, the energy and the vitality of it. Um, 
would that have worked in the same way in the opera house? I'm not sure. It may have done. And again, I think these things may give us license to, to try things in different ways. There's also something interesting about the opera house, which, which I have come to feel over, I've been in this company now for 15, 16 years. And we have one of the most beautiful Beaux-Arts theaters in America. It's a 1932 building, and it has this glorious gold proscenium. And uh, so the frame around the stage, and it's, it's, it's beautiful, it's sumptuous. And I've just come to think a lot about the role that that frame plays in our storytelling, because you can't divorce yourself from a big gold proscenium. That, that is there, whether you like it or not, you can't hide it. And so it's, it's always there around the stage picture. Um, some theaters have a completely black surround, and it's like the, the opera house disappears into it. For us, the opera house is always very present in it. So I think we, we have to be careful about exactly what we tell on stage, because it, it's like putting a Jackson Pollock painting in a, in a kind of gilded Rococo frame or something. It doesn't quite work. So that's why we're, we're thinking a lot about the venues we use. Um, can we go to new venues? Can we try things in, in different smaller venues? So that there's a there's a different expectation of experience. I think you come to the opera house, a, uh, that, that whole, if, if uh, your viewers remember that scene in Pretty Woman where she goes to the opera and she's actually going to San Francisco opera, they, they filmed it uh, in a soundstage because it was just after the 89 earthquake, so they couldn't do it in the opera house. But it's supposed to be San Francisco opera and we know the specific box that she's sitting in. And, uh, you know, she's having this glamorous, you know, fairy tale experience in, in that opera house. And I think for many people, that's a big part of when they come to the opera, they're being swept away into this magical moment of, of just beauty and sensuality. And, and that's so important as well for us to acknowledge and, and hold space for that too. Um, but how do you find the way to tell different kinds of stories in that same environment? So that's, that's one of the, the things that, you know, we, we increasingly need, need to look at as a company is understanding how we use that frame and acknowledging that people want different kinds of experiences as they come into the theater. And we have a very interesting question from Arsalan Khan on Twitter. And Arsalan asks, going forward, are uh, digital tools, and I'm going to broaden this to be digital presentation, uh, going to be a permanent part of your work, or is this just temporary until things open up? It's a question. It's becoming an existential question now for arts companies who did a lot of digital work last year, and now are moving back into the live. And what kind of space do they make for both, and what's the balance between both? And I will say that's true from both an artistic perspective, also a financial perspective. You know, we we were not producing last year, and um, we were not spending the kind of money that we would typically on performances. And so we and other companies had more resources available for that kind of digital work. Now it comes back, you know, do you keep space for both to happen at the same time? I think the big question for so many of us now is what will audience behavior look like? And how quickly will audiences want to come back into the live collective experience? How many will, will have health concerns that uh, keep them from doing that straight away, but eventually will get there? And for how many will the, bond, the traditional bonds of going into the city and seeing a live performance have now been kind of irreparably, irreparably broken? And they want a different kind of engagement. We'll have to see how that goes. I have to, we just went on sale, actually, for our... our a season coming up this week. And I'm, I'm pleased to say, knock on wood, that sales are going very well. So there seems to be an energy to get back into the live. I think to the, to the artistic part of that question, the key is going to be how can we deliver ongoing digital projects that actually convey the same kind of emotive energy that the Opera House conveys. And certainly we can share streams from the stage. We're, we're gonna be doing that this fall. We'll have live streams from some of our performances. So if people can't get to the Opera House for whatever reason, they can, they can watch that on their screen and, and have a connection. But I think what we're finding is that the, there's a huge emotional depth if you can unlock storytelling in a different way. And the way that people engage with digital, um, whether it be through social, whether it be through through web, is just inherently different. And all of that electricity that I mentioned before, that symbiosis between artists and audiences, is so hard to find on digital, right? Because you're not you're not in the moment with that person. Even if you're live, you're not breathing in the same air that they're breathing in. You're not watching every minute move they're making. 
Um, there's something about time shift as well. Like if, if you're in a dark theater and you could be watching a huge long Wagnerian opera for five hours and, and like literally the day has gone into night by the time you come out, you have no conception of time. You've kind of just been taken on this journey where you, you time stands still. That's much harder if you're watching that on your computer screen and, and the world is going on around you and you can see out of the window and so forth, right? So what we have tried to do, and I think to try and find a sustainable way forward is to try and find that more authentic core of storytelling and, and sharing that you couldn't do in the opera house. And we, we have a, a series out called In Song. We have a couple of episodes and it tries to get into the emotional connection between a singer and what they do, their art form. And their short things are about 12 minutes long and they, they try and bring you, the audience, into their world in a way they couldn't do live on the stage because there's narrative in it, there's, there's family connection, there's cultural connection. And I think, I think there are ways to do it, but I think the key is to get to that emotional energy because that, that vibrational connection is ultimately what drives people insane and, and makes them these passionate you know, opera fans for life. So I, I think we have to be, it can't just be a, a sort of copy and paste. It's got to be something where we are very intentional about the kind of activity that we put out on digital and really understand the relationship we want the audience to have with it. I think if we can do that, I think there can be, and I think there needs to be an ongoing relationship with digital because um, we can just have a, such a bigger connection than we could ever within the four walls of the opera house. So I'd say absolutely it needs to continue, but it needs to continue in a very intentional and, and thoughtful way. Have you figured out how to create that emotional electricity over digital? I think lots of people want to know that, whether they're in opera or uh, in the corporate world, making presentations, everybody wants to tell that story and establish that emotional connection. Yeah. And let's face it, most people do it really poorly. It's so hard. Again, I mean, you're taking a, not even a 3D experience, but a multidimensional experience, which is involving you know, elements of emotion and you're, and you're replicated, replicating it on a small screen. I think authenticity is, to me, is the key. That's the element on stage that makes, that takes you from a good performance to a great performance. It's that you're seeing that artist taking their own talents, their own expertise to the edge. They are, they are giving you 100% of what they have to give you. And if they gave you a percentage more, then you know, the whole thing might not work. They're, 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 it's like a great sports um, analogy in the sense of, you know, an athlete is taking you to the very edge of what they're capable of doing when they're, when they're performing at their peak. And so I think it's, it's getting to that same level of rawness, that same lo level of vulnerability, that same level of, um, again, authenticity about what an artist is doing and what it means to them. And if it's manufactured in some way, that would just show a hundred percent. I think about that with, and I get it, this is not this is not unique to um, to the opera world, certainly, but how how artists use social media, for example. Um, and the the artists, the opera singers who have been really successful in social media are the ones who are being very vulnerable with the world. Um, I was just interviewing great Finnish soprano Karita Matala uh, the other day, and she has developed a great following on Twitter and but she's doing it herself. It's not a PR person who's doing it for her saying, you know, sort of who's just describing what she's doing. She's talking about her life and she's letting people into her life. That's what an artist does on stage. And I think that's what we're trying to capture in the digital world is there has to be that element of vulnerability, unexpectedness, um, sort of surprise, like, wow, I can't believe they actually went there, or I could never imagine that person would have done that. We're doing a, a next in song video, which I think will be great. It's coming out in July, is with a fabulous mezzo-soprano, Jamie Barton, and the, the banjo player extraordinaire, Bella Fleck. And we, we paired them together. Jamie grew up in sort of deep rural Georgia, and we had a film crew go out and interview her with her father, talking about how she learned to sing in harmony at the back of the church. And we see her in the church there. Um, we see her kind of engaging with one of her idols, Bela Fleck, and then they're making music together. And again, there's a spontaneity about it. It's real. She's 
She's just consumed with uh, an amazing sense of energy for what's happening. He is too. He's, you know, they're, they're opening new artistic doors together and you feel that um, coming through the screen. So that, I, again, that sort of authenticity, finding something in the moment, uh, it can't feel manufactured in any way. You know, I find very interesting that this idea of authenticity and spontaneity and yet when you are putting on a full-blown production, as you said earlier, things are timed down to the split second, and yet you have to have it imbued with that spontaneity throughout in order for it to work. You do. And as you, as you talk about that, Michael, it makes me think, I mean, what we're doing, I talked about the frame earlier. I mean, the, the entire production is the frame for that spontaneity to happen, that um, you can you're creating through music, through technology, through the scenic arts, you're, you're creating that frame on stage so that a singer can be, can feel comfortable to be completely spontaneous and that they can do it night after night and just feel supported in doing that. Um, I was thinking about um, an artist, uh, Penny Patti, that we had doing Romeo and Juliet, uh, a, a French opera version of the Shakespeare um, back in 2019 and at the end of the third act, he does this unbelievable high C and it lasts for about 18, 19 seconds. I mean, literally people were timing him every night to see how long he could hold it for. And that's the kind of raw energy um, where you know, we create the space that he can, try, he can do that and feel comfortable doing that, even though that is completely on the edge. And it's funny, he said, he said, I really should have done that on the last night, not the first night, because after I did it on the first night, then I had to do it every night afterwards. Um, but that's the kind of thought process that artists are going through. They, they are staying spontaneous. We are, we are the sort of frame that makes, makes everything click so that when, when they walk out on stage, they know that the light cue is hitting in the right place. They know the curtain's going up at the right time. They know that the, the desk that they're about to sit down on is exactly the same place every night. There's no, there's, that's where there's no room for, for error. But then the art making that happens within that is, um, is incredibly spontaneous. And I, to me, that's one of the really magical things about our new music director, Ansan Kim, is that she really fosters that sense of collective exploration. Not just interestingly in the musicians and the singers, but the entire company. And, and she, she, when she did her first production with us, which after which we hired her as music director, there was just a an incredible sense of openness to everybody in the company being involved in that sort of spontaneous moment and an appreciation for that. So I'm I'm really excited for how that will come. But as yeah, as you as you ask that question, Michael, it makes me just think about that connection between the perfection. But then we still keep that spontaneity because that's what that's what drives audiences wild because they know that they've only just they are the only people who've seen that in that moment and uh, it will never happen again in quite the same way. Well, it sounds like this whole period of time over the last fifteen months is now shaping the way you think about the relate about the types of performances and the way that you relate to the audience going forward. It really is. And I think we're, we're now in this process of determining how we create the structures to allow that to happen on different layers. You know, we, we want to come back with great and grand opera and all of the, uh, all of the energy that the opera house brings uh, and has brought for hundreds of years. That we want to make sure that we keep and we protect because there's an incredible um, this huge value. And again, that's where the passion comes from and that's where the passion gets directed to. But finding the ways in which we can develop different products, whether digital or live, um, being experimental about it and creating um, funds. And, and actually, uh, we, we have established a new fund thanks to some very generous donors, which we're calling the Creative Edge Fund, which is intended to allow us to take risks and and not always to be driven to the performative endpoint. And I think that's that's really important for us because so often if we think about taking an artistic risk, it, the the manifestation of that is a new production. It's it's a you say okay, we're going to hire this new visual artist and we're going to ask them to do a new production of an opera by Wagner or something. So suddenly everything gets channeled into the into the rules of the road. And, and this idea of an outcome that's, you know, the curtain's going to rise on that new production in three years' time or something. 
So we're trying to develop much more of a, an iterative environment where we welcome artists into the company without saying, you've got to produce something and it has to fit into this box and it has to be done by a certain date and rather create a much more flexible environment with artists who can move the art form forward. Um, but if it doesn't work out so well the first time, it's okay because we can re-gear and try something different. That's a very different way of us thinking as a company, because so oftentimes we're driven towards what's that end goal and it has to happen and you have to have a design presentation on a certain date. And after that, it goes into the shop and it gets built and you know it's, it's big and expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm excited for where that can lead us because again, we are all creative people. We want that spontaneity. And I think if we can open the door in a different way to it, amazing things will, will happen. Well, Matthew, I had a conversation with two of your musicians, two young people who are just absolutely extraordinary, and we have that video to play. So shall we play that right now? Please, let's do that. Let's do it. All right. Anne-Marie, as a performing artist, what has the last year been like not being able to perform? As performing artists, we're stage animals. We love to be performing. Um, so to have all of that taken away from us has been a huge shock. And honestly, it has been really hard for the industry. I have many colleagues who have, you know, lost an entire year plus of work, and that's huge. I mean, I think that we are super lucky as Adler Fellows that San Francisco Opera has continued to support us, has continued to train us and keep us employed during this time. That's pretty incredible. So I would say initially, yes, there was this deep sense of loss, uh, this fear um, for the future. But I would say that as performers, we're also very much, you know, the show must be, go on, we are, we're adaptable. And I think that that's been a huge thing for us as individuals and a company that we've really tried to figure out how can we still develop our art? How can we still bring the art that I think is necessary for people, for humanity forward. And so for us, it's been a lot of taking a step back and um, developing our craft in other ways. Uh, we've worked a lot on languages um, and uh, delving more into that. We've worked on our acting skills over Zoom. So I've really been trying to take advantage of this time to set myself ahead for when things open up again. I know that video conferencing tools like Zoom and the others are not ideal for sharing a performance because of the latency. And mm -hmm. you've been working with Aloha. Tell us about that. It's a huge challenge um, for a lot of us. We are some of um, the luckiest people, I'd say, because this is the low latency systems that we've worked with have allowed us to at least sing most of this music with someone else playing. So you have a meeting of two artistic minds. I think that most people can have like some grasp of the latency issues just based on meetings they have if someone freezes or if just that like slight delay where it feels kind of awkward and you're waiting for an answer. Um, so if you can imagine that in a world where things are need to be precisely together that that makes an even huger difference for music so it's really like true music making with another person it's not possible over zoom um but yeah we had the luck to work with uh the aloha system by elk and um it was honestly pretty life-changing i i i did not comprehend that technology could have gotten this far because basically when you plug the system into your computer and you connect with the other person. How's your, uh, how's your volume there? Can I hear what oh, you yeah. sound like? Oh, yeah. That sounds like that'll be good. It's, it's like they're in the same room. There's really no perceptible lag. And that was pretty incredible, especially after like at that point, you know, 11 months of not being in the same room as someone else, not being able to perform with someone else. I know like for me there, yeah, there was a really emotional experience with one of those first early experiences. I had prepared a role throughout the pandemic, hadn't had the opportunity to ever perform with piano. And um, Stefan is my roommate. He was there when I was able to 
go through it with John Churchwell, the head of music staff at the opera, and it was incredible. As when I finished, Stefan like turned to me and said that it was the, the you know, the best he'd ever heard me sing it. Um, and I felt it. Like I felt that it was just. I felt so much more supported. I felt like um, I was able to exchange ideas with John, like the phrasing, all of that. It was just incredible. Stefan, when you're using the Aloha system, can you feel that energy in the same way? I think so. For me, I I felt that. Um, There's something um, so wonderful about um, singing with an orchestra, but there's something so intimate about having one singer and then having a pianist and then those two minds coming together. And it's really that fact that it's one person breathing and then the other person responding um, and how close the connection can be in that way. It gives it meaning. It's all language because we are singing on words, but sometimes it can be just that little nudge you need where you're thinking this might be harder for you to say, so it's a little slower and then you ramp up and it takes off on you. And you don't necessarily feel all of those inclinations when you're singing it by yourself a cappella in your room, but when you have someone else there with you kind of potting the conversation, and really it's a musical conversation, a meeting of all of the minds. And so, yeah, yeah I'd say that energy is palpable. Well, for those of us who enjoy and respect the performing arts, we are grateful for all that work that you've put in. Stefan Eggerstrom and Anne-Marie McIntosh, thank you both for speaking with us today. Thank you. You know, what amazes me about that is you have these two ordinary civilians who somehow get or to somehow transform themselves into the singing Olympians. I mean, it's just, I find it absolutely extraordinary. Isn't that amazing, Michael? It's just, I mean, it, it reminds us that, you know, when you, when you walk by someone on a, on a street, you have no idea what their talents are, what their skills are, what their story is. And uh, you're right. I mean, it's, you, you see that unlock in, in opera singers in a particularly amazing way because it's, it's just suddenly this amazing sound comes out of somebody and you're like, wow, where did that come from? So as we finish up, what's next for the San Francisco Opera? Getting back to do what we do. And, you know, it's, we're at this amazing moment, Michael, where we just announced our season a couple of days ago. Um, and by our season, I mean that the period going from August, so just in two months' time, uh, through, to, through to next summer. And, you know, it's this, it's this moment of just reawakening, of transforming everything we've been in back into the Opera House. And although California as a state has opened up fully, we still have huge amounts of details to work through and protocols to, uh, to work with and so forth, both for us and for our audience, because we want to make sure this is absolutely safe. So it's not a simple return. And again, we're bringing back this entire complex collaborative enterprise that hasn't been together in the Opera House. Again, we, we did the experience in Marin, but getting back into the Opera House and doing all of this for the first time in a year and a half. So it's this amazing moment of reawakening for us, for the audience. And if there's one thing which I think I've really taken away from this last year, it's the value of the collective experience. And I think we, we always felt this deep down. I mean, we, we are in the theater with other people. We're watching. We're having these amazingly cathartic moments. Like you watch the end of Bohem and you see the soprano Mimi dying and you're in tears, you're bawling your eyes out at what's going on stage and you're doing this sitting next to a complete stranger. I mean, you, it's, I can't think of anywhere else where that happens, where you can be sitting next to a stranger and having such an emotional reaction to something, but that happens in the opera house. And so that the richness of that collective experience and the fact that we see these stories of humanity told collectively and experience them collectively is something I think that we will cherish in a very different way. I, I had, I had my first sort of sample of that coming back out of the pandemic. We did a, uh, just a regular cinema uh, drive in back in November, December last year in San Francisco before we did the full live drive in. And so we were all sitting in our cars watching a, a, a rebroadcast of something we'd done at the Opera House uh, years before. And I was, I was a little skeptical about how that would be going into it. 
but my goodness, just to know you were watching something in the same moment as somebody else and you were all focused on this one thing. Um, that collective energy, I think, is, is so important in life in general. And um, our, our, our board chairman has a wonderful phrase he's oft used during the last year. He says, you know, we're, we're not a, a species of social distancers. We're a species of social gatherers. And I think the, the opera house and all the attendant ways in which we can deliver it are, are ways of gathering people together around these moments. Um, one of the first moments we'll actually be back, we're also simulcasting to the home of the San Francisco Giants at Oracle Park. And where we, you know, in the past, we've had up to 30,000 people there as well. We just wanted to get the entire community back as we flip this page, we turn to this new chapter, a new music director, a centennial around the corner, this whole spirit of innovation ahead of us. Um, all of that building on the, the just sort of century old tradition of the company. So I'm, I'm thrilled for the kind of bold return that we can make as a company. For, for folks who are watching, who find it hard to, who find opera inaccessible, they're not sure how to approach it, but yet they're interested or intrigued by it. What advice do you have to us ordinary people who are not opera, opera buffs so that we can learn and enjoy and find it engaging? Don't be intimidated by the essential core of, of what we do, because the essential core of what we do is telling is telling very emotional, very human stories. So the fact that it's in a different language sometimes it's all translated above the stage, so you can follow it in, 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 you know, in, in English as well. But even the narrative of opera, that's not the important part of it. Oftentimes people say, well, these opera stories are so crazy and they have all of these you know, people whose names I don't know and so forth. That's not the point of opera. The point of opera is to tell stories of love, of hatred, of revenge, these things that you can identify with immediately. And I think that's why opera works so well in films and advertising and adverts and so forth, because it has that emotional immediacy to it. And it's so interesting. I, I mentioned the Giants, and we've done a number of these simulcasts with them. And, you know, there's no, it, there's no expectation at all. You go in, you can get up whenever you want. You can go and drink beer while you're watching it. You can eat garlic fries while you're watching it. You, you can leave whenever you want. And everybody stays focused on this thing on stage. So you take away all of the barriers that uh, people are worried about, and they are still engaged in this storytelling on stage. And that's just always been something which I have cherished because I think it just shows me that the power of opera ultimately is something that can connect with us all. And so I, I would say, um, just go and appreciate it on its own terms. Don't worry about whether it's a soprano or a mezzo-soprano. I mean, all these artifices that we build up around it, it's kind of like wine. I mean, you can, you can take wine to the highest level of expertise and knowledge or you can just drink a damn good glass of wine. And so I would say just go and see a damn good aria and enjoy being in the moment with it. Matthew Schilvak, General Manager of the San Francisco Opera. Thank you so much for taking time to be here with us. I really appreciate it today. Thank you, Michael. Everybody, thank you for watching. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website and we will send you our great newsletter. We have great shows coming up. Check out CXOTalk.com and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.